Welcome everyone to Deep Waters here on Pro Box TV. As they say, every dog has their day. That's what we're dealing with today. The underdogs in some big fights coming up. I have the dogs to help me out. That's right, Polly Malinaji here in studio. Showtime, Sean Porter joining us remotely. So we know about, you know, Devin Haney, Ryan Garcia. A week from Saturday, they kick off their big fight. But let's talk about somebody else making news. Another underdog, and it's Luis Neri making headlines. Talking about Naoya Naoya. In a way, the monster saying that he's, quote, nothing special. Let's define, Paulie, nothing special. 26 and 0, 23 knockouts. Hasn't gone the distance since 2019 against Nonito Donaire. Right, two sides to see this. He's, he's hyping the fight. And also, Paulie, as you know, you got to believe you can win. And, and part of that is hyping yourself up, saying to your opponent, hey, they, they put their gloves on just like me. How do you take his comments? Um, I, I definitely think there's a selling point to this, okay? We talk about underdogs, and a lot of times boxing has a problem with making fights that are mismatches and not fighting the best. Not fighting the best. But I got to be honest, it's hard to find an opponent for Naoya Inoue, unless you go up to a bunch of weight classes where it's ridiculous, where I know Naoya Inoue is not going to be this much of a favorite. So it's, it's not like there's a lack of... <clears throat> Uh, we're not trying to find the best fighters right. for Naoya Inoue to fight. Luis Neri being this, this big of an underdog is not actually a knock on Inoue uh, as opposed to some other top fighters in the sport who actually actively try to uh, not fight the best opposition available. Inoue tries to fight the best opposition, yeah. opposition available, and it still doesn't really match up on the odds. Having said that, you got to believe in yourself. I can remember when I fought Miguel Cotto, and, and, and I was young, and, and Cotto was young, and he's a world champion, and I'm trying to challenge for my first world title. And I noticed every single press conference he'd had to that point, everybody was respectful. I want to thank Cotto for giving me the opportunity. You know, he's a great champion. This and that. I said, you know what? Screw this guy. F this guy. You know what? I, I'm here for him to take his title. I don't care if he likes me or not. I want to I wanna let him know that I'm not here to respect him, this and that. Yeah, granted, it was a bad night for me, you know? But <laughs> and I, I was an excellent, excellent fighter. And obviously, I knew I was fighting an excellent fighter. But right. in the moment, you're trying to play that mental game. And I think Neri's trying to play that mental game where he's trying to show, I'm not intimidated by this guy. Yeah, he's got a big reputation. Yeah, he might be a great fighter, but I don't care. I'm showing up to win, and I'm going to let him know that I don't respect him and I don't like him. You know, ultimately, you're, it's still a form of respect, even in a disrespectful way, because you're still, you're, you know you need to pump yourself up. You need to add that fuel in order to be ready for a, uh, an, op an opponent, a champion of this caliber like, like Noe Inoue. Now, Showtime, you, you heard Polly's comments about the mental warfare here. That could be a part of it. Do you think it's part of the, the, the strategy of Neri, and you think it might be successful? Listen, it would definitely be a part of my strategy. You're giving me Triple H vibes, Jim. I just have to say that. And then, <laughs> I'll take that strategy. as a compliment, my man. It's been a while. Good to see you again, buddy. I'm like, looking at you. I'm like, yeah, he's giving me it. Yeah, happy to see you. Yeah, I think, um, listen, this is what I know about Luis Neri. I've, I've watched him as soon as he burst onto the scene in, uh, in, in America. I believe being I was at his very first uh, debut fight that he had here in the United States. He is... Uh, very boisterous, um, kind of says what he wants to say, how he wants to say it, doesn't care who's who's, who's listening. And um, I, I believe a lot like Paulie said, I think he doesn't, tr he truly doesn't respect no, uh, NUA. And I think he also is trying to give that message to NUA that he doesn't respect him. But again, man, watching this kid very closely for a number of years now, N Neri that is, I know that... Uh, his talk is kind of cheap, man. I hate to say it. I hate yeah. to hate to kind of, you know, pop any bubbles out there. But I believe this kid's talk is cheap. I remember watching him in the ring against um, Figueroa. Seem seemed to me like uh, he broke he broke down very quickly against Figueroa. And that's a big man coming at you, Figueroa. A lot of size and a lot of pressure coming after you. But you know, looking into Neri's eyes during that match, I could see that he was he was folding. Um, I can see that same type of fight happening against uh, NUA where he just kind of folds under the pressures, especially being in Japan. You can only imagine um, a big a big crowd like that. Um, and you're very, very far away from being at home, how you could feel in, in a moment like that. So, um, you know, again, I, I feel like the talk is kind of cheap when it comes from Luis Neri. And when he says, uh, yeah, he's nothing special, I think you're kind of saying what 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 we would expect you to say. A fighter that doesn't respect uh, his opposition. That's that's kind of the 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 that's that's the the, the same ring ringtone that you use against anybody that you don't respect. Yeah, Showtime. You just mentioned it, Japan. Now look, uh, uh, Paulie. 
you talk about where somebody fights and where do you have to fight to be big in a way for all of his skills, as we say in the business, he's got the wrong passport, right? Does he need to get big here? Does he need to fight here? Madison Square Garden, does he need to fill up arenas here? Does he need to do that to be I mean, crossover big and how does he do it? I mean, listen, it's always cool to become big in the United States because the United States is sort of the melting pot for boxing, right? You, as far as I know, it's really the only country or one of the rare countries that you have foreign fighters, foreign champions coming here and getting contracts, getting TV contracts, deals with networks, deals with promoters. So they're protected. A lot of times, in any other situation, even Americans, when we got to leave the country, we're not protected by the foreign network or the foreign promoter. We, we're, we're in a situation where we're putting ourselves at risk even from the political spectrum. Foreigners will come here a lot of times if they're good enough, if they're pushed enough, if they're hyped enough, if they're great enough, and they'll get the contract. They'll get the, the you know, guys like Golovkin have done it. Guys like Canelo do it. You know, granted, Mexico is almost in the same hemisphere. Right. But, you know, we've seen guys that come here. Lennox Lewis, you know, uh, guys like that, you know, uh, where, you know, they're, they're coming with that push where they almost get the favoritism over even the Americans, you know? So, so I, I don't think that coming here is as big of a deal as Americans going out. So I, do, I would like to see, in a way, have more of a presence here in the United States. But having said that, it's also a small weight class. Remember, he's coming from smaller weight classes. A lot of times, these smaller weight classes don't get the same attention as they do in, uh, in the States, as they do in, in, uh, in, in Asia, where, there's, where the fighters, a lot of the fighters are smaller. Also, you know, that Alphaville song. Remember that Alphaville song? Big in Japan. <laughs> Anyway, he's big in Japan. What are you he, he's huge in Japan. Look, look, we know he's making big money, but, but, but as we say, you know, Showtime, you talked about it being popular in Japan. Is it a weight class thing? Is it a style thing? What do you think maybe gets him to cross over here in the States? You know, my, my whole thing is I, I follow that, 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 that phrase, to each his own, you know? It, it, Everybody's looking for the next star. Everybody's talking about how much money you can make and how many fans you can have and things like that. We really don't know what anyways what 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 his goals are. Are his goals to be the star in boxing? If his goal is to be the star in boxing, you got to come to the United States. It is what it is. You got to cross those seas and you got to knock down, knock out some Americans to make these other Americans take notice of who you are and what you're doing. There's a lot of people in the boxing world that respect Inoue and what he's done. But if you're someone like me, I'm saying, hey, let's get him. I'm not, I don't think he's going to lose, but let's get him out of that, out of his own backyard. Chain, let's I, get him I, a little uncomfortable and see how he handles the, 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 the energy when it's not at home. Well, we're discussing the underdogs, that's right. And when we come back, we'll discuss an underdog. We're not talking about the odds, but his behavior. Ryan Garcia and his words leading up to his showdown with Devin Haney. We'll discuss it when we come back. Wednesday Night Fights. On the next Wednesday Night Fight, April 24th. Ramon Cardenas returns to Pobox to steps up to the main event against Eduardo Ramirez. Welcome back to Deep Waters. We're discussing underdogs on the show today. And the first dog to get his opportunity, Ryan Garcia, Devin Haney, April 20th. I got a tough question for you here, Paulie. We've heard the talk of Ryan Garcia. It's gotten to the kind of absurd level. You and I have known fighters have kind of gone off the rails. Has it gone from amusing to maybe concerning if you're listening to his talk now leading up to this fight? I don't know. Is he... Is he crazy like he belongs in the psych ward, or is he crazy like a fox? Exactly. You know like, right. We've seen both. Right? Yeah, we've seen both. No. But I don't, I don't know, man. It could also, you know, you can only speculate here. You know, you can only speculate, um, and you have to at least wonder if maybe the moment is, there's too much pressure on him. You know, to where he's kind of losing his mind. You know, sometimes guys have there's so much pressure on people not just in performance situations, just in life situations, right? We, we've seen people, even in normal situations, where there's just so much pressure on them and they kind of snap and, and go crazy. I mean, it's certainly worth the conversation. It's, right. it, it is one of the hypotheses you could come up with as far as why is he behaving this way. But, of course, there's the other one, too. Maybe he's crazy like a fox. I don't know. Yeah, trying to make money with his comments. Showtime, I got to ask you, when it comes to uh, Haney versus Garcia, Garcia's comments, have they cost confidence in his abilities. A lot of people think, oh, maybe his speed would be a factor, anything like that. Now, it seems like the more he talks, the less people have faith in him. Do you agree with that statement? Um, I, I, I am a, uh, how do I say this? I am really looking at this. I got to the point where I said, you know what? This is too much. This doesn't make sense. 
And I feel like it's too much and it doesn't make sense because that's what he wants. I think he wants everyone counting him out. Uh, I wouldn't even be surprised to find out if he bet a, a ton of money on himself that, uh, you know, this is going to get Devin Haney and his team kind of to let down their guard in some respects or to not come to the ring with the with the necessary energy to get a stoppage or something along those lines. I I got a feeling that that uh Ryan Hain, that Ryan Garcia is gonna come to the ring, um like locked and loaded and and really ready to perform in ways that we haven't seen, uh, if ever. Um, I could be wrong, and um you know we we call this optimism. <laughs> I remind everybody out there that I am a Cleveland Browns fan, so uh, I know optimism at its highest level. And uh, that's where I'm at with this. I just felt like this is too much talk and th there can only be one answer. And that's he's sly as a fox trying to get uh, the Haney team to let down their guard, uh, if at all, and uh, hoping that it, it will help him prevail in this fight. Well, as a, as a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, I have to say it's all about coaching and talent <laughs> and effort on the field. So X's and O's that way, Paulie, what is the path to victory? What is the Steelers' path to victory in this case for Garcia? Is there one against Devin Haney who's incredibly technical? I mean, we, we look at the history of, Dev, of uh, Ryan Garcia. We look at Javante Davis actually called him a one-trick pony. He says he only looks to the left hook. And then Garcia showed up and only looked to the left hook. So... I mean, you got called out as a one-trick pony and still didn't work on anything else. You would hope that, you know, he, he's developing some other wrinkles in his style since that point, you know, because the cat's out of the bag, and if a fighter's good enough, he can actually tell you to your face, as Javante Davis did, you're a one-trick pony. You're only going to look for the left hook, and I know it already, and I'm going to take it away from you, and I'm going to beat you. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, that's kind of, I think that itself was more embarrassing than the loss, you know, the, the fact that somebody can call you out on, what you, on your flaws and then execute them just exactly as he said. So I, I think the... the, the the X's and O's part of it is, you know, add some deception either to your left hook to where it's not as clear when you're looking to use it, looking to set it up. And also, add a couple of things. I mean, add a right hand. You know, add some distance changes. Add some different looks to your style. I, I don't know. If, if the optimism that the champ Sean Porter's talking about, <laughs> it would require us having to see a gear in Ryan Garcia that we've not yet seen. And it would require us having faith that Ryan Garcia has a gear that he has not yet shown. Is it possible? It's, sure, it's, but I don't know. It's not it, likely. It's it's just like what Jim just said. Uh, when <laughs> as it pertains to this to the Steelers, great coaching, great skills, great talent. I think that I think Ryan definitely has the skills and the talent, but now he's got the great coaching. Now here's the thing: you have to be able to listen to the coaching. And we saw this in Ryan Garcia's last fight, where he didn't do a good job of listening to the coaching. Eventually, that that left hook prevailed, but. I can tell you this: Derek James will be te will, will be will be preaching fundamentals, 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 and also giving Ryan Garcia setups, giving him the deception that you talked about, Paulie. I know that Derek James is going to give him that, has given him that in training prior to the fight. It's going to be up to Ryan on fight night to implement what Derek James has showed him. But I can assure you that the deception will be there. The setups will be there. He'll be coming to the to the ring with a jab and a right hand that goes along with the left hook. And I think this fight's going to be much more competitive than a lot of people think it's going to be. And we're going to discuss more underdogs when we come back. That's right. Canelo Alvarez back in the ring. Will be another wipeout, or do we see an avenue to victory for a big underdog again in Munguia? We discuss it when we come back. Wednesday Night Fights. On the next Wednesday Night Fight, April 24, Ramon Cardenas returns to Pobox to steps up to the main event against Eduardo Ramirez. It's going to be a great night of fights. Join us April 24th, Plant City on Pro Box TV. Another great night is going to be May 4th. That's right, the return of Canelo Alvarez against Jaime Munguia. Right now, as I'm looking at it, a minus 550 favorite, right? Huge odds on Canelo Alvarez. But the people who are critical of him have talked about Paulie recently. Not the knockout machine, not the body puncher we're used to seeing. He's cruising on the scorecards. He's winning easily, but not with the savagery that he won with earlier in his career. 33, not old, but old in boxing terms. A lot of fights. Do you see any weaknesses heading into this fight that maybe Munguia could exploit? Well, I see a, a fighter who's kind of satisfied with his career, a, a fighter who's uh, satisfied with the money he's made and the su success that he's had. I see a fighter who's maybe not as hungry as he was before. 
uh, and doesn't show the ferocity that he was showing at one time in his career. And I think that's par for the course. We're all human, right? I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's just a human element of it. Um, and I know a lot of the, 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 the triple C's, the Canelo clown crew, they like to look at him as a superhuman, but Canelo is a human. And so at this point in his life, you know, you, you can see some of those things kind of dissipating, right? The, the, the ferocity, the killer instinct, the, the hunger, the desire uh, to kind of go for it and all, all that stuff, you know, but he's still savvy. He's a savvy veteran and he knows how to get through fights and, and win them at a, at a rather high level. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it's part of the course really. And then a guy like Munguia who's hungry, who's active, defensively flawed can make this a fun fight you know because he's he he brings an activity to the ring he throws combinations and bunches punches and bunches you know it's it th those are things that canelo doesn't always like to see doesn't always like to deal with is uh canelo's a, does canelo have the ability to punch in between mungia which where he's shown that ability so many times in his career can he do it between the the punches of mungia who can throw a little wide when he throws those big salvos and is the power going to take away the confidence from Munguia to throw those kind of salvos, or is Munguia going to try to run right through him? It could be a fun fight. Now, I'm asking you, Showtime, Sean Porter, champ, when, when you look at this fight, it, do you see any slowdown in Canelo? Anything where if you're Munguia's corner, if you're his trainer, you go, this is the time we can catch him. Do you think this is the fight, and how does it get done? Uh, Jaime doesn't have that savagery that, that, that David Benavidez has. He doesn't have the quickness. He doesn't have the power nor the speed. He does have some size. All that being said, I think that the Jaime Munguia team, they're looking at this fight saying, uh, this is this is right on time for us. By my estimation, they're a year or two off from being able to beat Canelo Alvarez. Canelo on the other side of that, looking at another, another young fighter that people can look at and say, well, he's undefeated, uh, he's young, he's charismatic in the ring, high energy, uh, what's wrong with this fight, you know? Um, but I think they know that they're they're a couple of they're at least one light year ahead of Jaime. Uh, I truly don't expect this fight to go the distance. Um, I think that, like Paulie said, there's a lot of flaws in the defense of Jaime Munguia. I think he's going to be in the, right in the line of fire. Uh, and again, to Paulie's point, I think Paulie could have done this episode by himself. Certainly this segment because he hit everything right on the nail. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be up to Canelo to punch in between the shots of Jaime Munguia. He's able to have that timing. Yes, to the to the point of your question, Jim, he has slipped in virtually every area that a fighter can slip in. But the man's 33. The man has been around the world of boxing probably five or seven times now. I think he's he's at his end. I think his tank is still right around. It's a little more than half full, but it damn sure ain't full. And I think that he slipped in a lot of areas. One area I think he may have certainly slipped in is timing. I don't think that uh, Canelo has the timing that he had four or five years ago. But if he's able to have that timing against Jaime, who, again, isn't as fast or as quick as some other fighters out there at 168, uh, I think Canelo, if he's got that timing, he may end up stopping Jaime Munguia. All right, Paul, I'm giving you $1,000 in hypothetical money. Let's, let's not go crazy here. Mm -hmm. uh, $1,000, Javante Davis, a minus 700 favorite over Frank Martin. In their showdown, we, I just told you the odds of Munguia. I'll give you $1,000. Who are you betting on? Um, well, here's the thing you have to understand with, when it comes to boxing betting and boxing odds in general. It's the politics are usually infused into the odds. So you look at a matchup, you're like, oh, I, I like this underdog. I think he can win. You know, I, I think... But... I learned this when I fought Adrian Broner. I couldn't believe I was an 11 to 1 underdog. I, I was mind blown. I, I started betting on myself in all, <laughs> all kinds, legally. But, you know, I started betting myself in all kinds of ways, thinking, like, you know, there's different paths to victory here. You know what I'm saying? Then when we got to the decision, listen, it could have went both ways. I get it. But I'm home. I'm the champion. Um, you know, the politics in that close of a fight dictate that I should usually get it. Usually when they want to give it to the, 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 way you, the way the politics is supposed to go. I didn't get the decision. That moment I realized, you know what, that's why it was an 11 to 1 favor is because it wasn't that there was an 11 to 1 difference in opposition. It's that even if you beat a guy like that, unless you knock him out, you're not going to get you're not going to get the win. I think Frank Martin is in the same situation here. I hate to say it. I think Frank Martin is good enough to match up with Javante Davis, and it can be a, a competitive fight. I think that, you know, Salpo over Salpo, speed, good boxers, you know, all that other stuff. Yeah, Javante has the power advantage, but Frank Martin is definitely a, a, a solid fighter who, who is not, in my eyes, a 7-1 to one on the dog when I look at it from a physical perspective, from a physical standpoint. But you look at the odds of being robbed in a fight, even if you do win, they're probably at like 100%. You know what I mean? You're probably not going to get a decision in this fight. You know? So, so that means you got to knock Javante Davis out. Can Frank Martin knock Javante Davis out? I don't think so. You know? So then you got to go into the, 
you got to go into the uh, uh, propositional bets and all that stuff, and that's where <laughs> I bring my boy Tommy Rain on. <laughs> that's where it gets a little bit tricky, but we discussed underdogs. Now we're going to turn to a weight class that is surprisingly barren right now, 147. That's right, we discussed the welterweights and the moves going on there when we come back. Wednesday Night Fights. On the next Wednesday Night Fight, April 24, Ramon Cardenas returns to Pobox that steps up to the main event against Eduardo Ramirez. Welcome back to Deep Waters here on Pro Box TV. Jimmy Smith alongside Polly Malinaji, Showtime Sean Porter joining us remotely. Look, when I talk about the best boxers of all time, a lot of them are going to be in the welterweight division, 147 pounds. That's throughout boxing history. Uh, in welterweight news, Jerron Boots Ennis has signed with Eddie Hearn. Matchroom, the question here, Paulie, in this formerly loaded division, what fights are there for him? What do you, where do you think he goes next in a division that usually you didn't have to ask that question? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of become barren at welterweight. You know, yeah. I look at it almost like uh, middleweight has almost gotten become become like that as well. And now middleweight is starting to slowly pick, creep up in momentum again. But it's you know there was a moment where middleweight had become barren after it was good for a while. And I think the welterweight division is kind of in the same position where it's kind of become barren. And uh, being a Jerron Ennis, unfortunately, had to wait his turn. He wasn't given a shot. I think at when the proper time was the moment was right for him. I think now he's sort of in a position where. His career has been a little bit mismanaged, you know, he, and he doesn't really have a, anywhere to turn to as far as getting the direct credit. He, I think it's kind of a shame, but does he really have any other choice to, as to what to do and what angle to take with his career? It, I, it, it must be very frustrating to be Joanne Ernest and his team. Now, uh, Showtime, this was your weight class. Now, a lot of people compare Ennis to Roy Jones Jr. Could he fall into the same trap of great fighter, ton of talent, but nobody around him to make a super fight in his division? What do you think, champ? Yeah, I've even uh, gone on record for comparing Jerron Ennis to uh, Roy Jones Jr. I, th I just think virtually the, the same the same fighter, just in a different weight class, different, slightly different size. And I think that that's going to be the exact case where um, Jerron is not going to have anyone who can challenge him for a number of years. And I've, and I've even said this. I think for Jerron, I think he can be a star in boxing. He won't have the dance partners to help him become that star. I like Pauly throwing out Conor Ben. I think that that's, that fight makes a lot of sense. I think that fight in England could, could make him a, a, a star in the sport. But once you get past someone with that kind of name recognition, but but the skills don't match up to the name, you know, it's like, where do you go after that? Uh, Jerron is going to outmatch just about everyone uh, in, in, in at 147. I think he might best thing he could do is move up to 154 and take his chances at some of these elite guys who have gone from 147 to 154. But even when you look at who's gone from 47 to 54, these guys are, you, most of these big name guys are at the end of their career. The timing just did not match uh, who Jerron Ennis as a fighter, who he is as an athlete. And it really is unfortunate because I think that um, with the kind of talent he has, I think he has everything that it takes to really just like burst out of the TV onto anybody's and be just printed imprinted on their minds in terms of who he is as a fighter, but he just won't have the dance partners to do it against, unfortunately. Hey, it's unfortunate, but he's got the talent. We've had the talent here tonight. We hope you've enjoyed here at Pro Box TV Deep Waters. We'll see you next time.